Hello and welcome back to my channel. This is once again a reading of Player vs. Player by Arena on AO3. This is a violent work of fan fiction. So if you don't like that or if it's triggering for you, I would please go do something else. And without further ado, please enjoy my reading. Thank you. Sasha feels sick. No, not sick. That doesn't even begin to encompass the heavy, sticky, disgusting pressure she can feel pressing against her insides. It feels like she's been filled with pond scum. She's sick, disgusting, wrong, evil, vile. She's vile. Sasha has never been the smart one. That was Marcy's job. And she's never been the intuitive one. That was Anne's job. She'd always been the leader, the planner, the one who had all of her shit together. But now, she can't help but wish for even a modicum of Marcy's intelligence, just a morsel of Anne's self-awareness, anything that can tell her what the hell she's supposed to do now. Because honestly, she doesn't know. Sasha had returned to Grimes' camp, though she doesn't remember how. And she'd somehow managed to shut all of her armor and change into nightclothes without any input from her mental faculties. It hadn't been until the following morning that her brain finally caught up with her body, and by that point, she was already mechanically shoving food down her throat. Then she remembered the sound. Needless to say, the breakfast had not remained in her stomach. Neither had her dinner. Did she even eat dinner? She doesn't remember. All she knows is that she had heaved until there was nothing left to expel, until her skin had gone slick with sweat and bile stained her lips with a sour taste. Toads run around her, some shouting, some making noises of disgust, some even voicing murmurs of concern, but she could make out none of them. All she could hear was the echo of flesh beings torn by steel, the wet thump that it made when it hit the ground the scream. She spits bile from her lips, nothing left in her stomach to expel, and sinks backwards onto her haunches. Every breath is a battle she barely manages to win. A pressure lands on her shoulder, but she doesn't have the presence of mind to look up and acknowledge it. The pressure gently shakes her, and upon receiving no response, starts to grow in intensity. Sasha can see. Her eyes are taking in information, but it isn't processing. The faces of toads, the color of the ground, the surrounding vegetation near the camp, even the tents pitched in every conceivable location, none of them register. They're there. Sasha can see them, but it's like her eyes have just shut off, the connection cut. The jostling isn't helping. Something escapes her. It might have been a sob, might have been a last trickle of vomit, Either way, her hands won't come up to wipe it away, won't move to hide her face. The shaking stops. Apparently, whoever was doing it either got tired or gave up. A hand waves in front of her face. She tries to focus on it, tries to force her body back into some semblance of order. But no. Something collides with the side of her face and she goes toppling over, slamming back down into her body at blinding speed. Her cheek is sore, her face feels wet, and there is a distinct ringing noise in her ear that she's certain wasn't there a second ago. Above her, Grimes stands, face pulled downwards in his signature expression of displeasure. What the fuck? She growls, eloquent, and receives something between a sneer and genuine concern. Something tastes like iron in her mouth. I tried calling your name. Grimes' voice always sounds vaguely disappointed, so it had taken a while for Sasha to figure out how to read him. Amphibian features hadn't helped, certainly, but she still managed. She knows what that slight tilt at the end of his sentence means, the unspoken question in the words. They have an audience. She turns to spit out the blood collecting in her cheek from where she'd bitten it. Red mixed with the green, and she almost starts heaving again right then and there. 
She forces her eyes to focus back on Grime. I'm fine. The words sound so much confident than they are. Of course, that's how she always is, always has been. An actor, a mask, a front. She is never what she sounds like, never what she shows, because she cannot. She cannot be weak. Sasha is a protector, always has been, and when she isn't protecting others, isn't protecting those who need it, she's protecting herself, or she had been. She can still hear the sound. Grimes' eyes, or I, stares her down, searching for something she'd been hard-pressed to name. He knows what she went out to do the night before, and he probably knows what the result was, even if she doesn't remember telling him. She doesn't know what he expects from her out of that. Whatever he's looking for, he finds. A nod barely little more than a tilt of his brow, shakes his head, and he returns back to the assembled toads. Orders are shouted, but Sasha doesn't pay them any mind. There's a trophy on Grimes' back. Anne's recovering, slightly. It's slow going, but Marcia honestly didn't expect anything less. The girls lost half an arm, and they're so far away from modern medical science, they had to cauterize the wound with a fire poker. She can still hear the scream. But Anne is recovering. She's yet to be conscious for more than three hours at a time, but each time she wakes up, she's more and more lucid. That should be a good thing. It is a good thing. But Marcy also knows what it means. Soon she's going to notice. Soon she's going to remember. Marcy loves Anne. She does, but she also knows Anne better than she knows anything else. Yes, that includes Vagabondia Chronicles. She knows that the truth will break her. Recovering from a near-fatal injury is one thing. Recovering from a broken heart is another. Anne always saw the best in people, the best in Sasha, even when she really shouldn't have. The amount of times in Amphibia alone that Marcy had heard Anne talk about finding and reconciling with Sasha was staggering. Now that was no longer possible, or if it was by some strange, absurd miracle of fate, Marcy wasn't so sure she would let it. In fact, she knew that she couldn't. It was a strange, unconscious decision, even as she was aware of it. It wasn't even a decision. It was a fact that she felt so deeply within her bones, she wouldn't have been surprised to find it engraved there. She would not let Sasha anywhere near Anne, not if it killed her. This was not an action that could be taken back, and Anne's wonderful, gentle heart would let it. She'd forgive it because she was Anne, because she loved Sasha just as she loved her. But Marcy was never a creature of the heart. She stands vigil over Anne's bed every night. She only has so many hours when she can be away from the guard. They're preparing for what looks to be a full-scale invasion, so she's got her plate full, but what little she can spare is always spent here watching as Anne dreams. She wonders from time to time if Anne dreams of home, if she dreams of her parents, or maybe even of the three of them back in school living their normal lives, or maybe even her dreams are confined here. Maybe she spends her sleep running from giant anthropods with her slimy skin family at her heels, always just one little jerk between certain death and living to flee another day. When Marcy does fall victim to sleep, it's always dreamless. No energy left for that. And so she has no bearings of what Anne sees when she closes her eyes. All Marcy can see is what's already in front of her, fast asleep. The creak of the door on its hinges rouses her from her musings as she slowly raises her head to find out that a pink frog is peeking in. His hat is missing leaving a soft-looking ginger locks to cascade around his face. Some distant part of her wonders if frog hair is also made of keratin, or some sort of amphibian equivalent, or why frogs have evolved to have hair in the first place, as seeing that humans is mostly kept for aesthetic purposes these days. Sprig smiles sheepishly and closes the door quietly behind him. He crosses the floor on quiet feet before reaching her side and sinking down to sit on the floor beside her, back against Anne's bed. Anything new? 
His voice is remarkably soft for the excitement that it can carry. Perhaps that's because of the hour. Maybe it's because his partner in crime is currently silent. Marcy shakes her head, a frown pulling silently at her lips. She was up a few hours ago, kept asking about you and Polly. For some reason, her voice sounds distant to her own ears. Sprig nods. His gaze doesn't quite seem to focus on her face. Sorry, I missed it. Marcy shrugs. Anne's bouts of wakefulness are few and far between, and almost always cut short by her straining herself too much. Truly, the girl's stubbornness is something to be admired. Just the thought brings an exasperated smile to her face. So far, she's only managed four, two of which with Marcy alone, one with Hot Pop, and one with both. None with Sprig yet, though, and Marcy can tell that the young frog is feeling agitated about it. Ancy, perhaps, is the better word. He's there almost as often as she is these days, a feat in of itself considering his inability to sit still for longer than ten minutes. He reminds her a lot of Anne in that respect. It's easy to see why the two of them became friends. Anne stirs slightly, and Mercy finds herself straining in her seat, but her eyes won't open. They flutter, and she gets a glimpse of the irises beneath flicking back and forth wildly. But she quickly settles back down, an incomprehensible mumble on her lips. Sprig pulls his knees to his chest. For a long moment, neither of them speak, letting the companionable silence of Newtopia's nightlife buzz outside their window. Crickets sing in the distance, voices rumble and carry along handcrafted stone walls. Someone is laughing, someone else is coughing. A snail beeps at another. The moon watches in silent judgment. It's grown over the past week, nearly reaching its half-full state. Finally, Sprague speaks. What was she like? The question is not unexpected. In fact, she's surprised he didn't ask it sooner. Who? She still asks, even if she knows the answer. She has to be sure has to know why he wants to know. Sprig looks up at her, and sure, he might be Silver Yosa Jr., and he might be a completely different species, but his eyes show her that he's not dumb. He knows what game she's playing. He knows why she's playing it. Her. Mercy snorts. Sasha was always a bitch. <laughs> that seems to take him aback. A surprised laugh bubbles through his throat, halfway to a croak. Marcy can't help but manage one herself. It feels good to finally say it. Anne's always had too big of a heart for her own good. For any of their good, really. She forgave way too easily and always glossed over things in order to look for the good. Anne may have had a habit of protecting Marcy from her own obliviousness, but Sasha had made a habit of protecting Anne from hers. She overlooked some of Sasha's less nice qualities because she was her friend. To be fair to her, I did too. Sasha was never a nice person. She was manipulative and controlling. She always had to have the final say in everything. Always had to win. Always had to be the best no matter what. And she always knew which buttons to push in order to make that happen. Sprig stares at her confused. Why'd you guys hang out with her then? Marcy felt a weight settle in her chest. She could tell from his expression he was expecting the worst, waiting for her to list off years of blackmail or a van's rose-colored glasses that clouded her vision. He wanted her to give it to him, wanted her to make it easy for him to hate her, for him to choose and paint an enemy. She couldn't, because she was loyal. That was it. The big, ugly truth. Sasha might have been a prissy little prick, but she protected her own. Humans aren't nice, Sprig. She meant it with every fiber of her being. You guys have your own conflicts here, but it's nothing like the human world. Imagine if someone told you that you couldn't be friends with someone because your skin was red, or your eyes were too wide, or because you were raised in a different place from them. Sprig's expression is frozen. 
confused. The human world isn't like Amphibia. It's dangerous, but not because there are monsters hiding around every corner. Because the monsters are wearing the same skin as you, and it's hard to tell which ones will bite and which ones can be tamed. Sasha knew which buttons to press to get us to fall in line, sure, but she also knew which ones to press to get everyone else to leave us alone. She was a bitch, but she was our bitch. She protected us. She looked out for us, and so we stuck with her in return. She trails off, and the silence of the night rises once again to greet her. Marcy hadn't loved Sasha, not like Anne had. Not like she loved Anne in return. Anne and Marcy made sense. Anne and Sasha made sense. Sasha and Marcy? That didn't exist. Oh, sure, they talked. They were civil, and they got along to a certain extent, but they didn't connect like her and Anne did. Marcy could never quite put down the sour taste that Sasha's burlesque attitude left her with, and Sasha could only stomach so much of her rambles before she started to seriously consider ramming her th head through a wall, but that was fine. As long as they had Anne to hold them together, they'd get along. As long as Anne was there, Sasha would protect her too. As long as Anne was there, Marcy would help Sasha with her homework and let her cheat off her during tests. As long as Anne was there, They'd work together in silent respect for the other, always there for Anne's benefit. That's how they ended up here. Marcy had found the calamity box. She'd intended it as a gift for Anne's birthday, but Sasha had other ideas. Now they were here. Amphibia has changed all of us. She finds herself speaking once more. Sprig's gaze, which had been taken to silently contemplating the wall, suddenly snaps back to her. I'd like to think that Anne and I has grown as people, matured somewhat, but Sasha? There was that weight again. Sasha's gotten worse. She knows what buttons to push. My sources say she's got grime under her thumb. She would find the idea laughable, Sasha having a literal warlord at her beck and call, but she's seen what she's capable of. Proof lays less than a foot in front of her. I fear that it might be too late for her. For a final time, silence follows her words. Sprig fidgets in his seat, uncomfortable. When Anne and I first met, his voice is still soft, still timid with the air of someone who knows just what hour of the night it is. She said some pretty weird stuff about friendship. Marcy snorts. Yeah, she would have. I'm afraid that Sasha and I probably weren't the best examples. Sprig cocks his head. But you, you're... He spreads his arms in emphasis. You're a good friend. You saved Dan from... I'm the one who got us stuck here in the first place. Sprig blinks. What? Marcy huffs. Half a laugh, half a sob. God, she's tired. No one's perfect, Sprig. We all do things we regret. I care about Anne, sure, but did that stop me from letting Sasha talk her into stealing the Calamity Box? That never stopped me from letting Sasha walk all over her. Sprig holds her gaze, but this is not an argument she's going to let him win. Every person has their regrets. Hers will always be her passive nature, her obliviousness. She can only hope to correct it with her devotion. Marcy? Her head snaps up, only to find herself trapped in wide, frightened brown eyes. Anne's awake. She's holding her left arm in her right, half risen to a sitting position. Where's my arm? A person can hold so many regrets. Marcy will make sure that Sasha lives to hold hers, to carry it on her back, on her spine, like the way it was always meant to be. She will make sure of it. She will force it onto her. This cannot be forgiven.